sort of like live tour of this. It's kind of a little bit of a test run, um, but it's exciting because we'll also be able to, there's an AR component that we'll get to test at the end as well. Um, but I'm just gonna bring up really quick, um, Jennifer Easton of the BART program, just to say a few words about the program. So Jennifer. to the art program is how do we bring a sense of the place, a 
of our stations into the stations, whether it's through art or history or dance or poetry or whatever it is. That's some of the things that we're really looking for with our program. So when this opportunity, actually, when the memorial started, we, the, they, we also came out and the old exhibit was kind of getting a little, it wasn't really meant for a long, long term installation. And so it really provided a great opportunity and the tech net was great about saying, yeah, why don't we take it and expand on it? And then we found Naomi and we got really fortunate that way. I had the sheer luck of actually having a, a history with the incarceration. Uh -huh. um, um, anyway, I worked for the Berkeley Symphony, and we actually did a stage operetta about the incarcerations about 15 years ago. And so I actually have worked on projects related to the incarceration. So this is a, just another chance to learn more, revisit, and get even more. This is such a rich history. And so I would point to our funders, California Humanities, and the National Park Service that does these grants specifically about the incarceration and the memorial got one as well. And it's just so important to keep that history alive and being investigated and integrated into our communities. Because as you'll see at the end of the exhibit, these things aren't lone incidents. They actually sadly do come back. And so the more we know about them, the more we're aware of them, the more that we can be on guard and make sure that the, the correct path actually happens or do we don't follow the same path we did before. So I'm thrilled to welcome you all here and enjoy. And we have another event on February 25th, so if you have people who couldn't make it today, I hope you'll be, they'll be able to join us at that event. There'll also be a panel that we'll walk through as well as a panel, so it's going to be really exciting. So thank you all, and I think Naomi, it's yours. because I don't have a loud voice, okay? <laughs> but uh, thank you so much to um, AWA for, uh, first off, uh, suggesting me for, the, for this opportunity to do a public art program on, um, on the incarceration, and uh, definitely, of course, to BART for providing this space uh, right on the site of where the Tamperan um, Detention Center was located originally. So I, um, to, this is just wonderful that we're able to get together and, and, and talk about it. And I wanted to go through the team of people that worked on this. So the project team included uh, myself as the curator, Jennifer as the art program manager, the Tamperan Assembly Center Memorial Committee and were advisors, um, Tamiko Nomura, if you know her, she's a, a writer who's done um, some books and, um, and some articles about the incarceration, um, and Carol Jung, who is the uh, graphic designer, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, and Paul Kitagaki, he was a, uh, he's a photojournalist who was involved with the uh, previous um, exhibition, and we've also included him in this exhibition. He has amazing work. Um, and Melanie um, is a curator and outreach support mm -hmm. person. And um, we had two um, interns uh, at the beginning of the project. Hannah Chen worked on the project and uh, to uh, carry through to completion, we have Melanie um, Bailey Nihe is here today uh, with us. Yeah, so yeah, we're very yeah. happy to have you all here. Um, we also had a lot of different uh, groups and uh, committees and friends that were involved with the project. Um, 50 Objects and Stories, that's Nancy Ukai's um, uh, project. She um, helped with some of the stories and, and uh, images. Uh, we had the um, archives of American art at the Smithsonian Institute. Uh, they uh, they Den Show, Fred um, Korematsu Institute, 
the Fresno State University special program of special collections, um, Heyday Books, Hayward Area Historical Society, um, the Japanese American National Museum, uh, Lee and Low Books, Library of Congress, and National Archives. So you can imagine over the time we worked on this, uh, we uh, got a lot of information as well as images with these different uh, organizations and it was a lot of back and forth and uh, 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 Melissa helped a lot with that so really appreciate that. Okay so <clears throat> I was just going to go through the panels and just talk about um, a few different things. Uh, my original idea for this kind of developed as the project developed because Originally, we were going to focus on the Tamperan um, uh, Detention Center, and we then, um, I started thinking there was so much more that people could, um, it would be important for them to know, and so we actually started out with, um, early on with the immigration, and we went all the way through to um, current times. And I'm going to just read my curatorial statement because it sort of um, says it in, in kind of a nutshell. So uh, the name of the exhibition is Tamperan Incarceration 1942, Resilience Behind Barbed Wire. And you were on the site of the 1942 Tamperan Temporary Detention Center where 8,000 people were imprisoned from April 28th to October 13th, 1942, due to their ethnicity. They were Bay Area children, parents, adults, and elders. Now a transit station and a shopping mall, Tamperan was the largest Northern California facility to incorporate, to incarcerate people of Japanese descent. 64% of who were American citizens um, by birthright. So upon its closure, many of the inmates were moved to uh, Topaz concentration camp in Utah. This exhibit honors and acknowledges these prisoners who lived in the repurposed Tamperan racetrack, commandeered for the temporary detention facility in early April 1942. <laughs> Through the hastily whitewashed horse stables covered Though the hastily whitewashed horse stables covered the horse hair and bugs on the wall, the indignity, stench, and filthiness could not be hidden. Even while surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards, a bright spirit of resilience flourished among the prisoners. The ginkgo leaf symbol dances throughout this display, representing their resilience, longevity, and endurance during this traumatic time. To create a sense of pride and normalcy, the inmates developed their own schools, library, newspaper, sports, and recreation activities. Imprisoned artists taught and made art, which in turn created solace and healing. Their artwork became powerful documentation and is displayed in the exhibition along with expressions of incarcerated descendants who strive to keep this history alive. The current exhibit replaces an earlier display that memorialized the 70th, 70th anniversary of Tamperan. The re revised um, presentation offers an expanded understanding of the 1942 Tamperan incarceration through personal stories, artist interpretations, and intergenerational experiences. My desire is that the exhibition inspires dialogue about racial discrimination, identity, and social liberties, and understanding the history and traumas of the past can lead to equitable and human, humane treatment of all people. Um, so we also encourage people to visit the Tamperan Memorial out directly outside the station, which includes the names of 7,984 7, incarcerates and a statue of the Mochita sisters who were among those imprisoned at Tamperan. So <clothes> that sort of, that's, um, talks about what the intention was. And we ended up dividing the exhibit into 
four different categories, injustice, resilience, legacy, and action. And one of the reasons we did that is because it's, it's being shown in a transit station, we sort of wanted to give people bite-sized um, areas that they could come look at maybe one week and maybe the next week they come see the next section and, and they could, um, we tried to make it so that they could enter at any possible uh, point in the history. <clears throat> and so that was uh, the, the uh, idea behind uh, what the, uh, how it was organized. We also had to think about um, durability issues, um, pigeon poop, <laughs> various different things, um, and and that took a few different. We did. We worked with a few different kinds of materials and and um, came up with this um, layout. So <clears throat> I'm gonna just <clears throat> excuse me, take you through. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay. Okay. So. Um, there was a few um, things I thought about. One is that it could be used as educational purposes. Schools can come and, and uh, different groups, senior centers, uh, different organizations could come as a place to learn about the incarceration. It's also a, a point of pilgrimage. So Japanese Americans want to come with their families, if they were incarcerated at, at Tampran, they could come and visit this and the memorial. Um, actually, I just recently was here and the San Francisco Mission High School um, API group was here um, on their own, just coming through to look at the exhibition. And, and uh, they were very excited to, uh, that we just sort of happened to meet each other by serendipity. So, what was also important to me was the role that artists played in the in the camps, and so um, that'll be talked about throughout the exhibition. So I included, as I mentioned, camp artists as well as um, descendant artists in the within the exhibition, <clears throat> and I picked artists, um, descendant artists, based on different things. Of course, I wanted their families to have. Uh, uh, they have had the experience of their families being incarcerated. Also, their pieces were strategically picked for different areas of the exhibition. And um, I, I wanted them mostly to be local um, artists. So um, this section called Injustice talks about how when the Japanese immigrants first arrived in Hawaii in 1885, um, they worked really hard in different capacities, uh, railroad, farms, um, sawmills, and, and um, canneries. They were in the sugarcane plantations originally, yeah, well, in Hawaii. But there was already at that point um, racially discriminatory laws that prevented them from um, legally owning any land or becoming American citizens. And yet they were um, they weren't allowed to become citizens until uh, 1952, and I think a lot of people don't know that, that there was all these roadblocks from them becoming Americans um, and fully integrating with our country. But they worked really hard, and they uh, built communities, they contributed to the local economies, and, and there was also some feeling of, um, uh, what shall I say, uh, some of the farmers, uh, some of the business owners they, uh, that were non-Japanese were had some uh, discrimination and 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 uh, feelings about the Japanese coming in and and doing so well in, in America. So by the time the um, the Pearl Harbor was bombed by the national Japanese. There had already been five decades of American surveillance and anti-Japanese anti sentiment, and that I think contributed to the to the uh, mass removal of people of Japanese descent from the West Coast during World War II. And so, this uh, if you later you can come up and see the map. This is a whole area that people had to be removed from. And they weren't given a lot of time 
to to um, to move. Basically, they had to sell their homes or their businesses and, and all their things or find some place to store it. They didn't know where they were going, what was going to happen. So you can see there's um, uh, historical images. A lot of them are by Dorothea Lang, who was um, hired by um, the uh, war relocation. Uh, was it War Relocation W R A and Authority. Authority? Yes, and 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 she was tasked with almost trying to make the incarceration look like it was okay or it was it was not as bad as it was. And so, um, but she also photographed other things while she was doing this. And some of these images were were hidden for a while and and um, so she saw what was really happening and it really affected her as a as an artist a photographer and a person doing documentation so you'll see those throughout um, this this image is by Sherry Wright Gabor and it's called Locked Luggage and I picked this image because it's, it just showed the, the suitcases and the idea of movement and and memory and and all the hopes and fears and stories um, so Sherry I don't know if you want to raise your hand Sherry's right here so, you sure you don't want to say anything <laughs> okay. all right so then we, we go into Tamperan and we talk more about um, what the conditions were like and uh, the, that they were in, this was the Assembly Center racetrack and just more about where these people came from, different areas of the Bay Area. Um, and um, they said the War Relocation Authority called incarceration protection for people of Japanese descent. However, barbed wire and guns on the guard towers were pointed inward. So, um, and I was very uh, adamant that I wanted to include this world, words can lie or clarify section on this uh, on the exhibit. So it talks about how the U.S. government and military used intentionally misleading terms to mask the harsher realities of mass incarceration. So uh, we picked a few words here. These are the old terms. These are the preferred terms. And then the reasoning of um, why, um, why the, the preferred terms are um, more correct in um, talking about the incarceration. So you can kind of see you can come look at this closer. Um, and there's uh, some documents that we've uh, given links to. And this is a picture of um, all the people standing in line. Um, I did that a lot and, uh, during the, the time they were there. Standing in line for food, standing in line for the bathroom, standing in line for showers. So, um, and then uh, this piece is done by uh, Lucy and Kubo called Japanese American Concentration Camp 2005. And I wanted Lucy to say a few words because her family was actually incarcerated here. So do you want to come? Do you want to use the headset? Do you want to use this? Um, six minutes and so I wanted to thank Judy, um, the curator, Asian American Women's Artists Association, the Tanfran Assembly Memorial Committee, 
and Bart for creating the Tamper Memorial, which honors the history of the 8,000. I'm honored to have my family's story here. Um, being a Sansei, third generation Japanese American, an important part of my experiences come from my heritage and understanding our community's forced removal to concentration camps during World War II. My art piece here is an assemblage with a metal circle found at the Heart Mountain Refuge site. So it's not necessarily from the concentration, but there was a, a, a refuge site at that area. Collage with a photograph by Dorothea Lang of the Mochita sisters, the Topaz Barracks and the aerial photograph. Recently, I've been involved in creating AAPI altars to support our community in, in joining this fight against anti-Asian hate and the recent killings <clears throat> of AAs in Monterey Park at Half Moon Bay only add more pain to our community suffering. I'm sorry. I have visited Topet Youth to, and now finally at the Tampering Assembly Center Memorial, the place my mother spoke to me about when I was growing up. Okay, I will now read a part of the letter she wrote during the struggle for redress and reparations in the 1980s about Tan Ferran. Um, I am writing, this is her, I'm writing this because of the fundamental principles that injustices were done and so that it may not happen again. My personal recollection of some of the unforgettable events are as followed. At the beginning of 1942, I can still remember the day when two men entered our dry cleaning store and they entered behind the customer counter, I sensed that something very strange was going on as they briefly talked to my father, then my mother, and in a very short time, they departed with my father. I ran downstairs to inquire whom they were and found out they were two FBI men taking him to a detention center. <coughs> what a traumatic shock it was for all of us. We were at a loss as he was the head of the family. My, my mother was told that she could be able to see him the following day so we went to see him bringing his pajamas toothbrushes. When we arrived, we were told he wasn't there and had been sent to a concentration camp. It was a shock to my family and we were not even able to say goodbye to him. And on top of that, the uncertainty of when will we ever see him again? How would you have felt under the same conditions? We finally heard from my father from Bismarck, North Dakota, during his trip, he was injured on the train by a sudden stop. There was no doctor around, so he suffered in pain that lasted a long, long time. We later learned that all Japanese who were heads of organizations or board of directors of churches or schools were picked up as dangerous enemies. On March 1942, notice was given to all people of Japanese ancestry and we had to get ready for evacuation in two weeks. What a turmoil it was, taking all of our belongings, and on top of that, trying to deliver as many of our customers' clothing and their laundry to them on a very short notice. We hardly had the time to do everything, and I still can't imagine how we did it. Orders were given for us to bring only what we could carry by ourselves, so we brought duffel bags. This is a delay of the Operations Control Center. We currently have a 30 minute delay. In the San Francisco homework direction, due to a train of service for a mechanical issue. We were taken to the Tanfran race track in San Bruno and found that our new home was a horse stable with freshly painted spider webs included. It was a narrow, divided stall. <laughs> with four cots and uncomfortable mattresses. 
It was cold, miserable, and smelly. There was no bathroom or heating, so you can see how depressed it was. Everything was a mess. How would you have felt in that condition? We had to live out of our duffel bags. For our meals, we had to walk across the center field through sticky mud into the huge grandstand three times a day. We had to stand in lines for everything. The restrooms and showers were community living, which we were not used to. There was no privacy anymore. What a difference it was from our home life in the city. After catching colds and getting sick, we applied for a newly built barrack with another family. Around September 1942, we were given another notice to get ready to go to a concentration camp. Just before we left, my father joined us in Tafran from Bismarck, North Dakota. Then they went on a train and what a surprise it was when we arrived in Topaz, Utah. A desert with scorpions, barbed wire fences. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my mother's story. The Taffer Memorial Exhibit is so important and especially the one that we saw outside also. I had never seen my parents' names written there. And so, as my mother said, um, injustice was done, and so that it will not happen again. So, thank you very much, Judy, and the people for making you know this ex exhibition here for other people to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien. That was so moving to hear the actual words of a letter that your mother wrote, and it really gives you more of an idea. I mean, a, to hear personal stories um, of your family. So thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad you could be here today to, to, to tell us about the story. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, include photographs of some of the hardships that uh, people went through at Tampa and some of the things that Lucian was talking about, but there were no photographs of cleaning out a full horse stall or the, um, the lack of privacy. So these were actually drawings done by Minia Kubo. She documented, it was almost like a graphic novel done back in 1942 or 1940, I think it was 1942. So um, it was really important that the artist, um, that she documented these so we could see what the conditions were really like. And uh, take that time and to come up and see these in more detail and, and read about the captions. Um, I think this is what's really important about having the artist work here because uh, it's, not, it's not like you can, it's not the same thing as reading it in a textbook, right? It's like these are real images of people that experience these hardships. So I'm going to move on here. This is uh, one of the posters that was put up on. Um, about um, it was instructions to all Jap to all peoples of Japanese um, ancestry, telling them how they had to prepare to move what they could carry or what they could not carry. And this one was actually uh, for the people that were in the um, Alameda County area, and I think this was supplied by. Um, Hayward, was it not um, the, the poster was from the Hayward, um, yeah, so, uh, and, and we wanted it to look, 
pattern like this because this is the, the reality of the, you know, these, these posters. Some has been kept in, in this condition. So, um, so then we moved on to the resilience section, and this talks about how they had their newspaper, the um, totalize, to, totalizer was about starting the schools. Um, and also talking about the art school that um, Ch um, Chiora Obata started. And uh, he, um, of course, had his own art practice way before he, um, he was at uh, the um, Berkeley University, UC Berkeley, teaching there. And he had to leave. And so he, he thought it was really important to start the art school with um, his friends, uh, George Matsuboro, um, Hebe, and um, Hisako. Kibi and uh, and um, uh, Minia Kubo was also one of the teachers, and so this is a picture of them at Tam Fran, um, some of the kids um, doing their art projects, and this was a really you know, uh, a way to keep the resilience up for the people that were there and giving them something to do as well as. Um, because they weren't allowed to have cameras, their artwork became really um, invaluable documentation. Um, so you can read more about that. These are some of the artists that were at Tamfran, including, um, as I mentioned, the Hebe's. Um, Tosh Toshio Mori was a writer. Um, this is one of Obata's images of Tamfran. Um, this was uh, one of uh, the Hebe, George Hebe's images from um, Topaz. And then uh, we have a poem here by Toyo um, Suyamoto. And she says, Camp Memories. I have dredged up heart fragments lost, and I fought in years of whirlwind dust. Exposed to light, silently rough, and broken shards confront belief. Also, Kei Sekamachi was um, there. Uh, she was a, a she attended the school. She was a teenager at that time. You may know her work now as a lot of fiber art. This is one of the, um, the watercolors she did while she was at Tamperam. And then we also um, uh, list um, Toyo Suyamoto and Yoshiko Uchita. Ochida. So um, you may want to look up more about these artists um, on your own. Um, and then we get into the legacy section, and this is the photograph that Dorothea Lang did of the Mochita family as they were getting um, ready to leave. They have their tag on with their family name and their number, and um, this is the, actually the um, girls are uh, part of this family that was used to uh, make the, the uh, statue that's at the memorial. And, uh, this is the first of some other images that were done by, um, this is a photograph by Paul um, Kitagaki, and he did this program called, uh, and he made a book and uh, a series of images where he down the families later and photograph them as they were now and then pair um, them with the Alliance photograph and it can be his project was called Dalbante that's the very spirit of which he said he did it over many years and so we we included some of his images here they're very powerful and um, he'll be um, attending in the February uh, time frame when we um, open it up more to the public. Um, so I also talked about three generations of art and creativity. So this is about the Hebe's and they're both artists. And um, here's a picture of Dorothea Lang with um, Hisako and her daughter. And then here's the photograph that Paul took um, of um, Hebe Lee. So this is her as a child, and she um, wrote a book. She wrote a, um, a, a book about her uh, memories, her mother's memories, and then um, I did 
Felicia Ketcher. Oh, here you are. Okay, sorry. So Felicia, Felicia's here because uh, she worked on, she did the illustrations for this book with uh, Amy Lee Tai, who is the granddaughter, and was the daughter, wait, let me think about this, the, the granddaughter of uh, Masako. So I, ha I asked uh, Felicia to come to talk about her experience doing the illustrations of this. Do you want to use the headset? Um, I'll try to project or either way. Either way. Can you, can you hear me at all? Better. Okay, right over the headset. Okay, okay. Hi, thank you so much, Judy, um, for inviting me here today. Um, so as mentioned, uh, uh, yeah, I illustrated um, A Place for Sunflowers Grow. Um, the author, Amy Lee Tai, is the daughter of Ibuki Hibili, and yes, and so her grandmother, uh, Hisako, and, and father, um, grandfather, uh, Matsu Saburo uh, Hibi. Um, so, you know, last last year, 2022, we or I shouldn't say celebrated, we acknowledged the 80th anniversary of the um, of the uh, the concentration camps and or, and um, the evacu um, not evacu forced removal, and um, simultaneously, my father turned 80. Uh, we celebrated on his 80th birthday, and so he was actually just, he was born in March, uh, early March, and um, so he was just an infant, uh, a, maybe a two months old, when um, he and his family um, actually uh, were in Southern California, and they were um, sent to post in Arizona. Um, and then on my mother's side, um, she was born after um, the uh, concentration camp experience, but her family, her side, were in uh, Minidoka, um, or in uh, Washington and sent to Minidoka, Idaho. So I don't have personal um, connection to um, the Tan Fran um, Detention Center and, um, and also uh, Topaz. So, um, I was approached, though, um, it would be 17 years ago. My son turned 17 this year, and um, he was born uh, right when I finished the artwork for this book. So, can, 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 um, so it's been 17 years, and, and um, Children's Book Press, which was a, a local uh, book publisher here, uh, they had already connected with um, the Hebe family and Amy. Um, they had actually seen uh, Hebe's Peaceful Painter book and thought we need to do a children's book. So um, they had already, you know, worked out the story and then um, they approached me. And it was one of my first children's book. Um, I had actually taken a class from, um, a, a, her name was Amira Reisberg and she, um, taught me about illustrating children's books. So anyway, um, that's how I was asked to be involved with uh, this book. And I will say up until that point, um, unlike perhaps, you know, Luc Lucien's mother who kind of outwardly spoke about her experience and maybe some other, um, other families, my family really kept it inside and my grandparents you know, I was told it was just kind of just too painful. Why go there? Why, why, why bring it up? So in my family, um, I didn't really uh, directly talk, talk to uh, my grandparents who experienced it. And then my father, you know, he was, um, you know, he stayed there for the first three years of his life. And although he he doesn't have like memories of it, he he does remember feeling the stress of the situation. Um, but. Uh, and then, of course, 
when I was in, you know, growing up in San Francisco, there wasn't as much being taught and, um, and, and, you know, really talking about this experience. So, um, being involved and in starting um, to do research for the book, uh, that was my educational experience. And that, you know, I had already graduated college and I went to art school, and that was kind of the first time where I, I went to the to Ninjas, the National um, Historical Society, and um, looked through uh, kind of, pre this was, you know, before. I could find a lot of this image imagery on the internet, and I just looked through their photographic archives, and um, so that it was just a really learning experience. So, you know, I did bring the book, so you're welcome to take a look at it um, as we um, spend the day. And I also just brought um, uh, kind of this is a process book that I created, um, so you're welcome to take a look at this as well. Um, but again, um, I. I just feel, yeah, I really owe a lot to this experience of illustrating the book. Um, I'm Yonsei, fourth generation, um, and so, uh, you know, yeah, having people come up to me saying they've read this book, and um, I, just to be a part of the project uh, is, is very meaningful, so. Thank you. So it's still available. Uh, Children's Book Press no longer um, exists, unfortunately. But Aaliyah Notebooks, as um, Judy had mentioned, um, they carry the books. So Aaliyah Notebooks, it's still available in soft cover. Um, so yeah. And again, yeah, I have a copy if you, anyone would like to take a look. Thank you. Okay, so um, this piece, um, this panel is called Preserving a Legacy of Caring, um, Shizuko's um, Quilt. And I heard this story and I just really had to include it in the, ex in the exhibition. I got to see the actual qu uh, quilt that um, Mark uh, Shinigawa and I went and photographed Satsuki and that was a really amazing experience. And to, to hear the story from her, but her mother was in Tamfran and uh, pregnant with uh, Satsuki's brother at the time, and some women from uh, the American Friends um, Service Committee, they, I think that's the Quaker group, they saw that she was pregnant and they were bringing food and vegetables and throwing it over the fence, and they saw that Satsuki was pregnant, so they said, oh, I hope this helps, and they heaved this blanket over the fence. So this is an actual quilt that um, they threw to her, and Satsuki never heard the story of this, and she was taking care of her mother who had become bedridden, and she said, why do we keep this ratty old quilt? Why don't we just get a new one and throw this one away? And that was when her mother said, no, you will ne don't ever throw this away, and she said, I held on to this blanket in camp because it helped me to remember that someone on the outside cared. So this is the actual uh, quilt that obviously they've not thrown away in this kept. And this is a picture of her mother and her brother in Sonsky in camp. So, and and um, you may know her. If you don't, she and Sonsky is a, a writer. She's a filmmaker. And uh, she's a trauma therapist and an activist. So she's... Um, really, I think this whole, uh, the, the incarceration experience really affected her to, to work with people that have been incarcerated and to be an activist to make sure that the story, the history is never forgotten. Okay, so down here, uh, oh, there's one more panel in this um, section, and this is about activists that were at Tamfran. Um, this is um, Fox um, Kitashima. And she was um, really
really uh, instrumental in the redress and the reparations movement for Japanese Americans. Um, she uh, mailed 8,000 letters and did these mailgram campaigns and connected with um, camp survivors to make sure they got reparation payments and she did lobbying and, and um, so I wanted to feature her and also uh, Fred Korematsu who um, was born in Oakland and he was actually spent two and a half months in jail because he resisted the um, evacuate the wartime evacuation um, and he said he um, and he tried he also sued the government uh, he had a, there was a Supreme Court um, case that he was challenging the military necessity of incarceration but unfortunately at that uh, initial um, court case he did not win and he had to be he was in prison in Tampran but later um, he re-submitted um, his, uh, the court case came to, um, came, uh, was retried and he was uh, actually, um, his conviction was overturned. So he was in instrumental along with uh, a few other people, that, um, resistors, and uh, he was instrumental in getting um, the, uh, the case overturned. So. I need to read more about that. And actually, uh, well, let me just say that um, in 1998, uh, President Clinton awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and uh, that's the highest civilian award. So, uh, two important people that were right here in Tam Fran. And these are two um, amazing panels that are chocked full of uh, amazing uh, uh, Paul Kitagaki's work where he did so much research to find people that were in the photographs that Dorothea Lang originally took and um, interviewed them and photographed them and, and this is part of his um, project that I mentioned earlier. So um, these are actually his, um, I think these are his grandparents here. So take the time to um, read more about this. The, the, the then he has then and now, and he has a family member, and it's really, um, it's just really uh, heartfelt um, um, research that he did to bring these personal stories to light. And this is, these are just a few of the yes. many, 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 and he's done deep interviews with the families as yes. well. And it was his own, like, exploring the archives where he found his own family in here that got him on this journey. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And, and he has a whole website. He has a beautiful book. So if you're more interested, that's definitely something worth researching. Yeah. And he'll be here. He'll come to the uh, February 25th event. So he'll be able to show you more and talk more in more detail. So this is the last section that is called action and this is talks about what happened when people left Tamperan and then were moved to Topaz concentration camp that was in Utah and uh, we we really uh, kind of had to condense so much history in this couple paragraphs but it was a really turbulent time People reacted to the incarceration in very many different ways. Um, it, there were resistors to the, there was a draft. There was um, a lot of different uh, uh, things that happened during that time. And I wanted to have um, Ellen talk about her piece right here because it's uh, I just, when I saw that I thought this is just perfect because it was it was. Um, talking about the loyalty questionnaire I wanted to find something about that so do you want to do you want the headset or you can talk can, can you hear me I'll just shout okay I'm not going to talk a lot but um, thank you <laughs> where are you <laughs> thank you and I just have to congratulate you again Jennifer and the whole team that put this powerful installation together is just kind of beyond words and um, I, I'm just so proud to have a little tiny part in it but um, this 
this is a detail of one of my art pieces um, that is actually it's a hand cut paper piece. So what I do is I take a black sheet of paper and uh, for this piece I just cut out the words no, yes um, to highlight the whole idea behind this so-called loyalty questionnaire. And I guess, I think you could read about it here, but um, it was notorious because it basically divided the whole community. They gave this question, the US government gave the questionnaire to male adults in all of the camps. I think they started in 1943. And um, it was a setup basically because you know, they just, they, they were basically asking, uh, do you pledge allegiance to the U.S. or to Japan? And, you know, that was a ridiculous thing to ask, but it divided the community, caused a lot of resentment and, and division and um, a lot of emotional scars that have actually, unfortunately, continued to this day. So um, I wanted to highlight that that whole incident and by just a very simple piece with just block letters but I wanted to make that feel very strong and, uh, and give it weight. So um, my family did not go to, to Tanfran or Topaz. I have, we had some very close family friends who did but my family went to uh, Heart Mountain for the duration, and um, it was my, it was all the family, extended family, which included my older sister who was a toddler, and, and so she was behind barbed wire. The early part of her life, which has always just impacted me, just the thought of my my little sister, my big sister who was young, um, going through all that, and I know. You know, as many families have experienced, there's the generational trauma that has continued. And I think in our family, we definitely um, experienced that. So thank you again, Naomi, for including the piece and oh, my, to everyone. My, my honor to have you. Thank you, thank you Ellen. Um, So this is another piece by Hisako Kibi, and I also include, this is the only uh, artist that was, uh, that just said, well actually he was in camp too, is uh, Roger Shimamura, and he's from the, he lives in the East Coast, um, and he, uh, look up his work if you don't know him, but this piece is about a soldier, a Japanese American soldier that was serving in Europe, and he came back in the 442nd uh, Regiment, combat team and he w was allowed to come see his family in the camps and he had to be uh, he had to be searched before he could go in to see his family even though he was he was uh, a soldier um, fighting for the United States so I just thought it was so um, ironic so I wanted to include um, that image um, so this uh, this panel is all about, I called it Path to Injustice, and it was about uh, what happened after people got out of camp. They got $25 and a few uh, resources, and they had to go on with their lives. And, and a lot of people, uh, as Felicia also mentioned, really didn't want to speak about their incarceration. And, and um, I feel that uh, as I, I, my family was at Tule Lake and I'm uh, Sanse, which is third generation, and I feel that a lot of those uh, people, my generation, don't really speak fluent Japanese because at the time their families just wanted them to assimilate. So I feel like in some ways we lost out on some of our cultural experiences. Um, so the Regis program um, was. Um, uh, the Sanseis kind of, um, uh, after uh, seeing what happened with the civil rights in the 1960s, thought about how they could right this wrong of their families and their ancestors. So they uh, were able to um, 
get the United to get the government to develop a um, redress. Um, oh, what was it? I just wrote it down. Oh, uh, they they got them a commission to look at what happened during the incarceration. And a lot of people came forth and spoke about their experience. And um, so it was actually in 1982, the commission designated that the incarceration was um, wrong, that was caused by racial um, prejudice, war hysteria, hysteria, and failure of political leadership. So, the, um, so this talks about that time and that how um, Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act and that uh, the, there was a presidential apology, a public education fund started, and a, a monetary uh, reparations for every living um, uh, survivor. So um, this is a really uh, important image that we worked really hard to get um, uh, Melissa and, and Max worked really hard on getting this image just because we wanted one from the Bay Area, it's from San Francisco. And this was held by the family that took the photograph. And so, um, yeah, we were very, felt very fortunate to be able to get that image. And then lastly, uh, this panel is about Never Again Is Now. It's talking about how um, uh, survivors and descendants have kept the history alive through going on, um, Manz uh, this is Manzanar, going on pilgrimages to the different camp locations, and they people have come forward to support other groups, like the Black Lives Matter, um, immigrant children, and, and families in detention centers. This was a photograph of a detention center in Texas. This is a group of um, youth leaders um, from Japantown. So basically, uh, this is what's happening now, and, and the, the, the um, Japanese American community has been very vocal about uh, different groups uh, being vulnerable and, and targeted, and 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 it's even I mean right now just with all the the gun violence that's touched so many of us, and, um, it's even more important to to keep um, keep fighting for for justice. So um, that's the program, and but I do want I do I say. Uh, and the new experience of the AR that we're just adding to the uh, exhibition that uh, Colin worked on with me. He was the, uh, worked on the, we worked together. He was made everything happen the, the, and uh, worked on the design and the technical part of it. Do you want to say a few words, Colin? <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, we have a few people with. Um, uh, we have, we're going to put a sign up eventually that's going to show how to get into the um, AR and there's a QR codes. But right now we have a few people I think that have the AR up on their phones. Yeah, can I jump in there? Oh, oh yes, I'm sorry. Um, Jennifer wanted to say a few words before she so has to So I do have to leave. So and thank you first of all for coming in. And I, I, again, this is just an amazing, amazing experience for our station and for you all to share your history is it's a big deal. So thank you, it's not easy always. And it's just, so many people thank us about this exhibit. I don't even pass them all on to Judy, but we get a lot of thanks. And so thank you. Now, for those of you who took part here, we have an A plan and a B plan. If you're gonna stay for the social hour, I guess you all are going up. And we're gonna see the memorial. And you're gonna see the memorial. So wait, so you have the chance, to, so you all can see the memorial. But if you're gonna go to the social hour afterwards, Please tag out, use your ticket and tag out, and then go to the social hour, come back, tag in. If you're just gonna see the memorial and then go home or go back on BART, you can go out the side gate and then they'll let you back in on the side gate. So if you're gonna stay here, hang out, you know, then please tag out and then tag back in because your, your pass isn't good enough, long enough, basically is what they answered. But if you're just going to see the memorial, listen to Doug speak, and then come back in, then please go out the side gate and then come back in on the side gate. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so if, uh, if anybody has, I don't know who has AR up, if you want to take a look at it, 
basically um, it, it's a image of um, a girl on a cot sleeping which is tied to my uh, my own artwork called dream refuge and uh, Colin and I made this uh, animation of bob wire and ginkgo leaves and um, and it's and you can hear uh, the story there's there's um, audio in it and then you there's also some images of uh, Lucian and her um, some of her artwork on it so I think there's a few people that have the AR that if you want to take a look at it um, who ha who has it up that you can raise your hand so that they people can go check it out yeah, you know, go ahead. oh just Melanie so far <laughs> 